take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 77 this morning. Grief, lament, and the goodness of God. Something in many ways we just sang about in this final song. So having come to the end of 1 Thessalonians, I wanted to take a week to consider the topic of grief and lament. <clears throat> and as you can see from the bulletin, and as I've mentioned already, we're going to look at Psalm 77 this morning to do that. And you might ask the question, well, why? Why Psalm 77? Why grief and lament? And <clears throat> there's a couple of reasons, and one of them would be that this is something personally I have been struggling with some over the past couple years, and I've been trying to understand and trying to learn how to express a lament to the Lord. Something I've also been just personally doing some reading on and I've been helped. This idea of grief also came up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. You may remember we covered this uh, passage a number of weeks or months back where Paul says, brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. The notion of grief is an area of our lives that God cares about, and we should not be surprised when we find ourselves walking through a season of grief. <clears throat> I want to mention two books that I have benefited from. Guys, if you can go ahead and put those on the screen. Um, these are just two books that have helped me over the past couple of years and have helped me as well as I've even come to Psalm 77. Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy by Mark Vrogop. I'm not sure if that's how you say his name, but I'll go with that. I believe he's a former Cedarville grad from many years ago. And then another book called Untangling Emotions by Alistair Groves and Winston Smith. Both of these books I think you would find helpful if you wanted to chase this topic down a little bit. You can take that away, guys. That's, that's fine. I also want to say that though I'm using the, the word grief, this topic could be broadened to any kind of suffering or struggle that, that we have and that we encounter in this life. And particularly for the notion of grief, grief is when we've lost something, when we've not been able to acquire or achieve something that we've wanted. And it often comes with negative feelings, it often comes with sadness, sometimes frustration, sometimes confusion. And yet as we find ourselves in the midst of grief, <clears throat> As we're, as we're grieving this, whatever it may be that we've lost, we can be reminded that even this is a, is, a, is a means of God to point us back to Him because we recognize everything that we have comes from God. And so if we've lost something, we're recognizing that it, it first came from God. So it's an opportunity for us to turn to God and say, I need you. One of the things we need to do in the midst of our grieving is lament. If, if grief is what we experience, lament is going to be what we do. Lament is our crying out to God, often through tears or in much pain. It's asking God for understanding when we don't understand. It's asking God for help when we feel weak. And just as grief sometimes comes in waves, our lamenting can often be an ongoing experience as well. We're going to see this morning as we look at this passage that lament, though it is a very personal thing, it is also intended to be a corporate thing. Though it's something that's very private to us at times, it's also appropriate for us to do this together. We even are commanded to be those who weep with those who weep. And none of us in this room this morning is exempt from grief. Even the youngest child who has his toy snatched away by, from him by another child experiences some measure of grief. But <clears throat> though it can be small, temporary, sometimes our grief is much larger and longer lasting. Just think of some ways and some reasons that many of us have experienced grief. Perhaps it's Perhaps, and very often, it can be related to the death of someone who's close to you. Maybe a little one, maybe a parent, even a pet. 
Maybe it's a hope that has been crushed, a hope that's never been realized. Maybe it's a relationship that's been broken or, or a relationship that's been for a long period of time in stages of being broken. Maybe it's a family member with a debilitating physical condition or a chronic health issue. Maybe it's the loss of financial stability. Maybe it's related to a move from one geographical location to another geographical location. Maybe it's some form of injustice in your particular life situation or in the broader world at large. There's many, many ways and reasons that we can experience grief in our lives. And if your experience has been anything like mine, I suspect when you find yourself in a period of grief, sometimes you're unsure what to do with that. What do you do with your feelings of grief, these feelings of sadness and loss? Sometimes the tears just come and you don't know what to do with them and you don't even know why they come. Perhaps we suppress them. We don't wanna talk about them. Maybe we're afraid to look at why we feel so sad. Maybe we just realize there's so much that we don't understand that we just don't want to deal with it at all. And then for the person who is grieving, when we encounter that person, we often don't know what to do with them. We don't know what to say. Sometimes we try to say something and then we realize what we're saying just seems trite or insignificant. Or perhaps sometimes we're in too much of a hurry to get people just patched back up and back into the game that we're not willing to just sit with them in their grief. Sometimes we struggle to just listen and say, wow, that sounds really hard. I would guess in our society, we do not feel as free to engage our grief or to express our laments as probably would be helpful for the people of God. And I want to encourage us this morning that God is not unaware or unprepared for our grief or our laments. In the Psalms, he has given us inspired examples of how to deal with the suffering that we experience in life. And sometimes this suffering is a result of our own sin and stupidity and things that we have done in life. Sometimes, the result of, sometimes the, our grief is a result of someone else's sin against us where we may not have done nothing wrong in that particular situation. And sometimes our grief is not directly connected to any sin, but it's just the fact that we live in a fallen world with broken people in a broken society. We're gonna see this morning that it's okay to feel bad. And in fact, sometimes as the psalmist presents to us, it's even good sometimes to feel bad. Jesus himself walked this path of grief and lament. In John chapter 11, we're told that Jesus wept over the death of Lazarus. He looked at his, the death of his good friend and he looked at the sisters of his good friend and he saw them weeping and he too wept. In Hebrews 5, 7, we read that in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. When Jesus considered his death, he was in agony and he cried and he grieved and lamented before his father. And so I want us to hear this morning that grief and the expression of that grief through lament is not a sinful experience doesn't need to be a sinful experience. In the passage that we're going to consider this morning, we see a man who is struggling to deal with trouble in his life. To us, from our perspective, as we look at Psalm 77, the trouble is unknown. We don't know why he is struggling, but it's clearly a struggle that goes to the deepest part of his being. <clears throat> we see a man here in Psalm 77 who is attempting to lament his experience. He's attempting to express his grief to God, and he says he finds no relief and he questions God's love, he questions God's compassion. He asks a lot of difficult questions. And as we come to the end of the Psalm, though we have no evidence that the situation has changed, we find him looking back to the salvation of God. We find him looking to the goodness of God. And so this morning as we come to Psalm 77, before I actually read it, I just wanna give you the outline that we're gonna consider. We're gonna consider, and you can put it under three S's, the suffering of God's people, the struggling of God's people, and the saving of God's people. So we see how God's people suffer, how they struggle, and then how they are saved. So let's take a look at Psalm 77. I'm gonna read these 20 verses, and I'm gonna be reading it from the ESV. Psalm 
to the chief musician, to Jeduthun, a psalm of Asaph. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Selah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled, I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. Verse 10. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, this morning as we come to your word again, as we come to this particular psalm, Lord, we ask for your help. We ask for your help as you come to meet us in the midst of our grief and in the midst of our lament and in revealing that you are a good and gracious God. Father, we pray that you would help us as we hear these words that were written so long ago. We pray that you would open up our eyes and that your spirit would take them and encourage us and strengthen us wherever we happen to be this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to begin by considering this first category of the suffering of God's people. So you see here at the outset that this psalm is written by Asaph. And you see here that <clears throat> he is a troubled man in these first few verses. You see in verse 2, he says, in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. He says the same thing in verse 4. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. And this trouble gets down into the depths of his soul and his spirit. Look at verse 2 again. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. So he's talking about what's going on in his soul. He's talking about his spirit, the moanings and the groanings that he has. And whether this, with, whether this trouble of Asaph is external to him or whether it's something internal, the effects of the discouragement have reached his soul and the struggle of his soul is now affecting his physical being. Look at verse four. You, the reference here to, to God, you hold my eyelids open. It's a, it's a euphemism, I guess we could say, for he can't sleep. I'm not able to sleep. Whatever's going on in my heart is keeping me from getting rest. Again, he says that in verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. He's basically saying, day and night, I'm dealing with this trouble. All day long, all night long, I'm, I'm seeking you, Lord. My, my hand is stretched out in the middle of the night. Though my arm is not wearied of stretching out to you and calling for you, I'm not sleeping. I'm not getting rest. My body is exhausted and I'm worn out because of my trouble. Verse 4 tells us he gets to the point he cannot speak. I'm so troubled 
I cannot speak. I don't think this means he physically couldn't put words into his mouth, but he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't understand his circumstances. And so he, he says, all I can do is I feel like I can moan. Have you been in this situation before? You feel like you've cried all the tears you have to cry. You're emotionally exhausted. You're frustrated. You're confused. You're moaning. You're dis- discouraged. You're disappointed. And when you seek the Lord, when you go to the Lord and cry out to Him, your soul refuses to be comforted. Maybe you're scared. The pain you feel isn't so much physical, but it cuts deep into your heart. The questions that you ask don't seem to have answers, and in many ways, you're not even sure what questions anymore you're supposed to be asking. You're broken down, you're sad, you're grieving, maybe you're mad in a sense, and, and as you look at all these emotions that you experience in some ways, the, the whole mix of emotions just puts you into a spin again. You don't know what to do with that. You cry out to God, and your soul refuses comfort. This is part of the suffering of living in a fallen world that Paul talks about in Romans 8. He tells us the whole of creation is groaning under its bondage to corruption. If creation is groaning, it's no surprise that we too will be groaning inwardly. And even as we're gathered here this morning as God's people coming to put ourselves under him, we are not as God's people exempt from this kind of groaning. We're not exempt from great periods of suffering and disappointment in our souls. And one of the points of encouragement and application that I wanna bring to us this morning, and I think that this is true of this psalm, is that we are not alone in the suffering, in the grieving, in the trials that we experience. Asaph is showing us that he's been there too. But I want you to notice here that as the the new, uh, the new King James says in the, the little subscript to the title here, to the chief musician. I think the ESV says to the choir master. Asaph is writing here from the first person. He's got some lament, some grief that's going on in his heart. But he says, this is for the people of God to sing. This is for all of us to come together and recognize this is a reality that we all share in. We are not to walk this journey alone. And even though we don't know the circumstances surrounding Asaph's trial, we can be encouraged that we are not the first ones to have walked through something like this. Even as I mentioned before, our Lord Jesus has been there. He wept over Lazarus. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. He was in agony in the Garden of Eden. Now, I can, I can read those few words to you. I can read, you know, we, we joke sometimes that Jesus wept is a super short verse in the Bible. We just fly right through it. But you don't weep in a couple seconds that it takes to read that verse. If you're weeping, that takes time. That, it doesn't just happen like that. It, it's, a, it's an experience that is not just a fleeting thing. Jesus' emotions would have been, been involved. His heart would have been hurt in some way. Again, Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications, how? With loud cries and tears. Many of us can reflect and say, we've been there. We've felt something of that kind of a pain. Maybe some of you this morning are there in that place. And I want to encourage us that we're not alone. This is common to man, even common to the people of God. And I've asked you if if you've been there, but I want us to think now corporately, have we as a body corporately been there? I think we have at times. But how how many of us in this room have been there? And yet, maybe if we were to look around and look at everybody else, we can sometimes think, wow, everybody else is just doing all right. They're not walking through the grief that I'm walking through. They've not been in the trial that I've not been in, that I've been in. And yet the reality is every single one of us has been there to some degree or another. And yet many of us, many of us, have walked through that grief alone. And my hope is this morning that as we consider this psalm, that we're encouraged to to realize that we are not intended to walk through those things alone. In fact, if you think about this, we are intended in some ways to even sing this together. 
not just share it in our experiences, but to even sing it. So as we consider the realities of grief and the trials that we walk through, how are we, how are we to respond to that? I think one of the answers that we see in this psalm is that we are to attempt to bring this to our God. We are to struggle through this in bringing these griefs to our God through the experience of a lament. In this section, we're gonna consider under the struggling of God's people. We consider the, the suffering now, the struggling. And what I mean by that is our, our bringing this to God. How do we communicate this to God? You see Asaph in verse one, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God and he will hear me. You see him doing the same thing in verse two. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out. He, he's, he's physically representing what he's trying to do in his heart in seeking the Lord. You see it in verse three. I remember God. I meditate. He's attempting to come to God, and yet at the same time, he's confessing, when I do this, I don't find any relief. In verse four, he's struggling to speak. In verses five and six, he, he, he attempts to reflect on the past. He's trying to figure things out. He's trying to look at his circumstances. He's trying to look at what he knows about God and put it all together. Verses five and six, I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've found myself attempting to make a diligent search. What do you, what's he searching for? He's trying to find something. He's trying to find some kind of answers to the, the dilemma that he's in. He's wrestling with his situation and trying to figure out how to think about it. And yet, even though there's a lot he doesn't understand, he's trying to remember the Lord. He's trying to bring this to God, and yet he groans and his spirit faints. And then he comes to verses seven through nine. And in seven through nine, you're gonna see that he's gonna ask some difficult questions. And there's maybe, in a sense, he's asking these questions on the other side of the questions where he recognizes that the answer to every question he asks here in seven through nine, the answer is no. Maybe he's on the other side or maybe he's still in the midst of asking these questions. And even if they are rhetorical in a sense, you don't rhetorically ask these questions unless you've already been wrestling with these questions. And look at what he's asking. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? One thing I want you to notice here is forever, never, forever, for all time. I think what he's getting at here is, this has not been a fleeting experience in my life, Lord. I'm now thinking in the, in the time, I'm, I'm thinking in time elements. Why does this seem so long? Why does this seem like forever to me? He's struggling with God. He's questioning things that he thought were true of God. He's wrestling with the, the feelings that he's having. He feels spurned by the Lord. He feels like God has quit Quit showing favor to him. Quit engaging with him. He feels that God's love has just stopped. And as for the promises of God, these glorious promises of God, no, they're done now. Him being merciful and, and compassionate, no, now he's angry. And it's not that just Asaph is somehow academically reviewing the, the nature of God. No, he's, he's, he's wrestling with these things. And as you come to verse nine, you almost see him, and we're gonna see this in a little bit, He's bringing an accusation against God. Um, God, have you forgotten? Have you forgot? The almighty God has forgotten? Is that really what's going on here? God, you've told us that you're merciful and you're gracious. You're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is a, a, a description of God that's multiplied throughout the Old Testament. And now he comes and says, God, where, <laughs> where are you? Have you forgotten? This is not the only place where, as we see in the Psalms, that, that the psalmist asks questions of God. There's actually a theme throughout the lament Psalms of them asking God difficult questions. And I wanna, I wanna bring out from, from some other Psalms, but I wanna bring out some more of these questions. Two different types of questions, actually. One of the types of questions deals with how long, 
And one of the types of questions deals with why. So just listen to Psalm 13, 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now in Psalm 13, verse 1, the psalmist is addressing God and he's saying, you've forgotten me, God. You, you, you have. This is the reality. You've forgotten me. How long are you going to do this for? Again, you see this time element. There's, there's been a lengthy struggle here and he's, the psalmist is asking, I don't understand why this is going on. How long am I going to have to walk like this? And by the way, you're, you're hiding your face from me now too. Not only have you forgotten me, but what you seem to be doing in my life seems cruel. How long is it going to be like this? But it's not just the how long question. There's also a pattern in the Psalms of why questions. Psalm chapter 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble. So you see two things going on in this. This is Psalm 10, verse one. Why are you doing this? When you see these why questions, what's it, why do we ask why questions? Because we want to understand. We want to, we want to fathom what is happening and why, is this, why are we walking through this experience? But secondly, I want you to notice the accusation again. God, you are hiding yourself. You think about somebody playing hide and seek. What do they do? They actively go and make themselves disappear somewhere. And this is what the psalmist says he feels like God is doing. What's your purpose in doing this, God? Why is this happening? These are questions that the psalmist asks. These questions are inspired. These are questions God wants us to see. These are questions God wants us to hear. This is part of lament. This is part of expressing our grief to God. You might say, well, I'm not, I'm not convinced that these are things we should be doing. These are questions that Jesus even asks. Psalm 22, 1, which is then quoted on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? This is what our Lord Jesus was doing. We live in a fallen world. We experience deep elements of grief. And we ask ourselves, what are we to do with that? Many of us, as I said, are unsure what to do with it. And maybe we think we're not allowed to ask questions like this. I want to encourage us this morning that the Psalms are not only given as an example to help us realize that we're not alone in this struggle, but they give us an example of how to articulate this struggle to God. Jesus himself wrestled and groaned in this manner. And it's good for us to express these questions and concerns that plague our soul. Not in a proud manner as if we are sitting above God telling him that we are the ones who know the right way to do it. But as a child who comes to the father and says, I just don't understand. And this is the feel, these are the feelings that I'm having. And it sure feels like you're hiding yourself and you're blocking me from you at the moment. This is what godly lament looks like. One of the authors I mentioned said that lament is the song we never want to sing, but it's the song for which we're deeply thankful in the midst of our suffering. It's how we express our disappointment. It's how we bring our sorrows to God. It's the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and God's promise of goodness. And it's more than just talking about our grief. It's asking God for help. At the end of the day, it's trusting and believing that God will one day answer. It's trusting and believing that though we don't understand, that God does have reasons for what he's doing. It's trusting that one day God will make all things clear. And it's grieving, not as those without a hope, but with those with a hope of a future that is better than where we are at right now. The trials of life can produce deep emotions that are not based on truth, but nonetheless feel true. In bringing these sorrows and frustrations to God, we're allowing him to carry the weight of the sorrow that we feel in the midst of those moments of grief. 
I think sometimes we can forget that God has made us as emotive beings. We can somehow forget that he knows all the experiences that are going inside of us. Do we think that he doesn't know the questions that are running through our minds and therefore that we should not ask those questions? This is what Asaph did. But more, it's what Asaph wrote for the people of God to sing and what Jeduthun put to music so that the people of God could sing it. Lament definitely includes bearing our hearts to God and perhaps doing it over a period of time. But lament finishes when we fix our hearts in our minds, in our eyes, on the character of God. And that's what we're gonna see in the second half of the psalm this morning. We've looked at the suffering of God's people. We've looked at the struggling of God's people. And now I want us to look in these last 10 verses at the saving of God's people. Let me read verses 10 through 13 again. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? This verse 10 in particular marks a transition in the psalm. And if you, compare, if you compare the latter verses of the psalm to the earlier verses of the psalm, you see almost two different people expressing themselves here. And though he's coming to realize that there's some of his questions that will not be answered in his life, or perhaps in, in the moment where he's at, what does he do? But he, he turns his eyes away from his circumstances now, and the rest of the psalm is not about him. It's not about his circumstances, but he lifts his eyes up and he begins to look to God in a new way. And in many ways, he looks backwards. He says, I will remember, I will ponder, I will meditate on what I know about God. Verse 13, your way, O God, is holy, you are a great God. So you, I, I ask myself, and maybe you're asking yourself, what changed in this, what, what changed right here? A moment ago, he's doubting all this about God. A moment ago, he's moaning and groaning and confused and frustrated. And I wanna suggest to you that the answer of what changed is he began to look back onto the historical realities of God's saving acts. He's looking back to something sure. He's looking back to God's redemption of his people from Egypt. He's looking back to how God has historically been good. Look at verse 14 and 15. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. His mind is going back to the Red Sea experience. His mind is going back to how God brought them through the Red Sea, how God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. He's remembering how God took a family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and he turned them into his people at Mount Sinai. Verses 16 to 20, let me read those again. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Again, this is the, the Red Sea here. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. What is, what is Asaph doing here? He's saying, I want to remember the great acts, the great saving acts of God. He's remembering even the shepherding acts of God in verse 20, how you led your people like a flock. And at the same time, he's, conf he's confessing. You see in verse 19, this interesting phrase, yet your footprints were unseen. What's he getting at there? I, it's, a, it's a little bit mysterious here, but I think what he's potentially getting at is he doesn't understand how God was doing all that he was doing through the acts that happened there at the Red Sea. He's confessing. There's, there's mysteries of providence that I don't understand. God, you were there. You were there at the Red Sea, but you left no footprints to be seen. Asaph is lifting up his eyes out of his own circumstances, confessing that there's things he doesn't understand. There's realities of his life that are difficult, and yet he's looking 
at God's character and God's salvation. And now for us this morning, we can do that. We can do everything that Asaph just did there, but we also sit on the other side of the cross and we have a different historical reality that we can look back to. We look back to the cross, and even as Pastor John mentioned this morning, what was Luke doing in his gospel was detailing the historical reality of the birth and the life and the death of Christ. We have something greater than the redemption of Egypt to which we can look. We have something greater than God taking a family and turning them into the nation of Israel. In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our tears, we can say with Paul that we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and historical reality gave himself for us. Paul in Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? But you might say, well, it sure feels like you're hiding over there from me, God. How do I know that you're for us? It's as if Paul anticipates that question in the next verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but what did he do? He gave him up for us all. How will he not graciously give us all things? How do we know that God is for us? How do we know that God loves us? How do we know that God is not actually hiding himself from us? We look to the cross. We look to the cross as evidence of God's favor toward us in the midst of our confusion and discouragement. In the midst of our trouble, we may feel like God is being cruel, but by faith, we look to the cross, we look to the person of Jesus. Even in this last song, I I was thinking of some of these things where it talked about in the midst of our weakness and our pain, we looked at Jesus was born. We can look to the cross, we can look to the birth, we can look to his life. By faith, we look to these things and we say, if God gave us his son, how will he not graciously give us all that we need? And it may take some time We may not see the reality of our circumstances change, but there's coming a day when we will see these trials as light and momentary afflictions which achieve for us or prepare us for a glory that's beyond comparison. We are not to be those who grieve without hope. We look ahead to the coming of Christ, to the day when all things will be made right, and we anticipate that day even in the midst of our grief and lament. Living in the circumstances that we do, we remember the cross of Christ. We remember the goodness of God in giving Christ for us. And through the gift of lament, we bring our sorrows to God. We honestly lay out before God the questions that we are asking, the struggles that we are having, and then we look to Christ. By faith, we look to him. Just as as Asaph remembered the redemption of the children of Jacob and Joseph, we are those who remember the redemption of Christ. Just as Asaph remembers how God led his people by the hand of Moses and Aaron, we now look to how Christ leads his people, his bride. And we confess that we don't understand all the mysteries of providence. We confess that we don't often see the footprints of God in the experiences of our lives. We know that there is a good God who sits behind those experiences and orders every detail of our lives. There are some of you here this morning though that when you grieve, you are those who grieve without hope. You look back to the cross and you don't see anything that has been done for you. Though you know you should be following after the Lord, though you know you should live for him, you have not been. You've been rejecting him. You've not been listening to him. You've been refusing to turn to him. And this morning he comes to you and he says, come, I am a gracious God. He calls you to come to him, to turn to him, to repent and to believe. I want to encourage you to do that this morning and to talk to somebody about it. As God's people, we are not exempted from the suffering of this world. May we this morning follow the pattern of the psalmist and bring our griefs and our lament to the Lord. And then having done that, at the end of the day, at the end of our grieving and lamenting, when our our soul is able, we look to the Lord, we turn our eyes to the cross, and we rest in his goodness and care for us. Let's pray.
Father, this morning we come to you and we want to, we want to confess that sometimes we don't understand. And Lord, we confess that sometimes it's just a moaning and a crying when we attempt to come to you. But we pray that as we see Asaph and Jeduthun and the people of Israel struggling in a way that reflects sometimes the struggle we have, Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith, that you would help us to be able to lift our eyes out of our circumstances and to look to the cross of Christ where you demonstrated your favor and love for us, where you showed us, Lord, that that you're not hiding from us, even though it feels that way, but that you are working for the good of those who look to you. You're working for the good of your people, Lord. And so I pray that as your people, you would help us to turn our eyes to you, to see how you have brought about our redemption, and to see how you shepherd us and lead us as our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.